Grant Shem piloted the Canadian Chen Pao list that was popularized since the World Championships to a top eight placement at the Peoria Regional Championships. It definitely seems like one of the biggest high roller decks in the game right now in that it can have some of the most powerful turns possible in the game with its unlimited damage cap with Hailblade being able to knock out everything in the game, even VMAX and, you know, Charizard EX, some of the bulkier stuff in the game. Chen Pao can easily just blow through these with the super cold ability from Bats Calibur allowing you to ramp all your energies into play in one turn. With Shivery Chill, with superior energy retrievals, you have no problem getting through the bulkier threats in the game. And up against the single prize matchups, you have double cancelling Cologne and your Cross Witcher Greninja combo plays, where you will try and cancel the ability of a Manaphy after bringing it into the active position so that you can shuriken down multiple Comfey or multiple Rolts or Curlia or even like Damaged Guardi plus the Manaphy itself so that the Greninja itself can take multi-prize knockout. So this deck can churn through multi-prize turns and actually can represent single-prize board states. That's the main incentive around this deck list where you almost always will only be putting down one Chen Pao EX at a time so that you can manipulate the prize trade favorably for you with your multi-prize combinations, be it with your single prizes or with Chen Pao simply racing other multi-prize Pokemon. So that's the whole incentive around the deck. The reason why I say it's kind of like high roller is that it's quite resource intensive in the opening stages. Going second, you definitely need double Frigibacks. You probably want a Bidoof down as well. You need Greninja cycling through your water energy. Sometimes to get water energy flowing, you need to be shivery chilling as well. So you need to have a really wide board in the opening stages, meaning you're going to need your VIP passes, your Nest Balls, your Pokestops, or your Iridas. You're going to need a combination of those cards, as well as the physical copies of your basic Pokemon, to assemble decent board states. And even after that stage, you know, early Judges, definitely Path... Um, and even just like random Ionos can put you into weird hand combinations where you can't really get much done over a few turns. So it feels very vulnerable on turns one and two. But after that stage in the game, if you've been able to navigate those first two turns, you honestly feel like one of the best possible decks because you have Industrious Incisors protecting you from general hand disruption throughout the mid game. You have Super Cold so you can just ramp to Greninja or ramp to Chen Pao as and when they're required. And... Once you've used Irida to thin some of these Pokemon, as well as, you know, your Bull Search cards to thin the Pokemon, once you've used Shivery Chill to thin your Water Energy, your item density is insane in the deck. So Pokestop ends up being like an extra support that you can play on your turn alongside your Iridas and your Ionos. So it's a really nice sort of puzzle deck in many ways where you're trying to constantly maximize the amount of cards you can draw with going up and down in hand size with industrious incisors knowing when to shivery chill first versus just raw drawing in certain instances uh weaving in concealed cards you're constantly going up and down in the hand size also constantly reacting to how much energy you can burst into play with your access to retrievals using super rod to then instantly shivery chill at times as well there's so much going on with the deck and you're constantly having to calculate your odds of hitting big combinations and also making sure you have enough resources remaining in the game to close out situations where you know we only have two bats caliber we only have the three rare candy managing your superiors and your ultra ball discards throughout the game is also going to be a really integral thing to keep track of so there's a lot going on in the deck. It's quite a complex one, actually. I think um, just because it's like a league battle deck and stuff, it, it, Chen Pao on the surface looks like it's a fun beginner deck. But the way this list is crafted actually makes it one of the most like turn-by-turn -turn puzzle explorer decks in the game, really. So it's certainly a fun one. Um, but you really have to accept that you do have... Um, internal inconsistency. I think that's the main thing holding back this archetype, basically from greatness, because its matchup spread is super appealing right now. It has one of the best times into Charizard and Gardevoir out of any other deck in the game, and it's, you know, reasonable into pretty much every other matchup because you have a combination of decent single prize attackers and very good uh, multi-prize threats. So you actually can navigate a really good prize map against pretty much everything in the game, but it really comes down to how quickly you can get that rolling and how these uh, hand combinations align. Sometimes the cross switcher cologne players just don't come in time <laughs> against many matchups where your opponent can sort of evolve out of these situations and whatnot. So uh, windows can sort of shut on you at times, which can make the deck a little bit awkward. 
So, yeah, I think typically you're battling against yourself as Chen Pao, and you're actually very happy going into pretty much every matchup in the game. So, a super interesting one. Let me know your thoughts down below, because I'm certain everyone has been back to the drawing board since they've heard about the Canadian build, where it's very different, where there's no V-Stars, obviously. There's not even Luminion, which would look on paper really important for a deck like this, where you have such a low support account and you're playing for Ultra Ball, you'd think it would be a no-brainer, but just the way this deck tries to navigate its map it just doesn't really fit in the deck it doesn't fit with the theme here where you're trying to force that very solid prize trade the entire game let me know your thoughts down below and enjoy the games if you're looking for ptcg live codes make sure you check out the po town store you can get a five percent discount on your orders using that code omnipoke so getting into this first game we have a really strong start with the double vip as well as a few uh, basics already in the hand and an Irida as well. So everything you kind of want. And we are getting to go first. So this is going to be one of those games where, you know, when you get the ideal board state, this deck can look incredible. And I think uh, that's what we're going to look for here. I see Squawk makes me think it's basically either Maraidon or Lugia, right? And in both of those situations, I don't mind having an early Chen because I don't really expect a boss high roll into uh, my two prizes super early on and it is going to be uh, Miraidon. It is possible for them to knock us out. We have gone wide on the board so they could match us and go for like a Raikou play but it's not super high odds in with the Squawk lead. Uh, but our board is really nice and set up now the opponent's been able to unit themselves into a good spot as well. And definitely deliberating what they should be doing here. They get an energy drop onto the Squawk, which makes me even more uh, happy that we're unlikely to get knocked out. But they do go for an aggressive boss line here. It would force them to hit double generator. Uh, they just hit one. And then they just retreat into a single prizer. So they, they went for the high roll, but had the backup of uh, getting out of there as well, which is, it's kind of yucky, but um, means we're gonna be in good shape. We have a really strong hand. We can get the bib barrel developed into the backs. We already have cross switcher, so if we can uh, carve our way towards a two price knockout, it's gonna be incredible. No real help from the five from bib. We're gonna go for the shivery plus, um, uh, what's it called? Concealed cards. But we don't draw into a, su a uh, yeah, superior, so our damage output is capped. I did hit the cross switcher, but no energy recovery. So we are just going to have to go for a Hailblade for a single prize knockout here. Not ideal when we're up against a sort of racing matchup that we can so capably 2v2v2 us. But of course, uh, we've taken one prize on the Zero Aura. We've been the proactive player here, so we can... You know, keep a one prize board state for a turn and finish off the Mareep that's currently on the board. So we should be able to, provided we just chain a steady flow of attackers here, have no issues. I think the only things that could trip us up at this stage will be like Path of the Peak stopping us shivering out some energies and forcing us to continually find superiors. But as long as that happens, we shouldn't really have any issues. We already have a bib down, so I'm not too concerned about Judge or Iono particularly. See if it does go for that Raikou KO. Uh, we have Irida in the hand, so this is another opportunity to go Candy Backs, probably, honestly. And just means that we're... Okay, I just go back Superior. That's also pretty okay. Um, still with the intention of possibly getting a Candy in at some point. We are going to get rid of Cologne, because it's not for this matchup get rid of the VIP. I think Candy Backs was kind of fine there as well. Oh no, I didn't have guaranteed energy, right? Yeah, I had to go for Superior. Um, but you can see that I have the backup Backs sort of in mind right now, and we're going to try and maintain the single prize board state for a turn. So I can finish off the Flaff, and then we're going to be in uh, good shape in terms of our prize race. Once again, we've evened it up, forced our opponent to take a single prize knockout, and then, you know, they are littered with multi-prizes, so we should be okay to go over the line. I have Chen in hand, I have Cross Witches and Superior, so the hand is absolutely stunning. The opponent's going to get a Zapdos in the mix. It'd be a good Pokemon for them to attack with this turn, force me to have Gust. But it looks like they're just attaching to Miraidon and researching. 
see the fleet-footed. And they've taken the one prize knockout, which means we should have a pretty easy map here to close the game. We actually take uh, Candy off the top, which is nice, so it's going to mean we're even more robust to hand disruption at this stage. Um, well, not even hand disruption, just sort of board disruption. We'll have double backs developed, so that won't be a headache. We've redeveloped the Greninja, which is basically threatening game next turn on that Squawk right now. So that's looking excellent. We have four water in the discard pile for our superior. We have the Shivery Chill. I can continue to draw with Greninja if I really want to. I basically just don't have much good fodder for this Ultra Ball. I want to make second bib, right? Um, so we can get rid of Cross Switcher and uh, Cologne, was it? Can't even remember. We can Super Cold, get one more card in. Again, just constantly looking for fodder, really, for the Superior. <laughs> we can get the... Possibly could have taken the Chen to hand there, but the Greninja is threatening game anyway right now. So it wasn't mandatory to take the Chen there. We can just uh, power up the Hailblade. We're holding crossies for next turn. That is going to be a good way for us to uh, threaten that Squawk and get around any attacker that our opponent puts into play now. Like their best play is maybe like a Zapdos Gust KO on a Greninja or something. That would force uh, some generator hits, but it looks like they're just going to come in with a two prizer here. No hand disruption really stops us. We have double bib with 13 cards left in deck, and a lot of them are insta playables. We do see the Arvin. This could be grabbing Bravery Charm. That's the way to protect themselves from the Greninja, at least. So they are going to do that much. And they're going to respond on the Chen. Makes sense. Uh, so cross switches is definitely going to be part of our line here. So it's just going to be about thinning the hand down. Uh, before using our bib draws to close the game here. We can recover. Chen. Three Chen is probably a little bit overkill here. Probably should have just done one and one. Um, but regardless, we do draw into the Chen Pals pretty quickly. We had so many outs there. Could even thin the extra energy from the deck. Uh, yeah, we're just over KOing by a huge amount here. <laughs> Showing off the big blitz of damage that can happen at the late game. So the deck can just be absolutely insanely powerful. And it felt like we were really checkmating from like turns two or three there. Where we just couldn't be disrupted out of game. But the double bib developed. You know, you, you just keep drawing back into the good stuff, basically. So often... This time we're up against uh, Guardi, which is one of our historically best matchups, especially with the double cologne. Um, definitely a question mark whether or not to poke stop here. I kind of like it. It does get us into some bull search. Going to get Greninja, which gets us even more dig here. The concealed cards. I can hold Ultra for next turn for Bib Draw. Uh, so we can just pass things over there. The opponent instantly recognises that they're going to require Manaphy. A pretty rough poke stop getting rid of a Rolts, but at least they got something from it, which is a Rolts in return. Uh, let's see what else they have going for them. Psych Energy to the Rolts. Just a uh, teleportation, maybe? Supporterless, perhaps. Yeah, looks like they're supporterless. Oh man, the Irida top deck uh, means we can get Candy backs, and we're just one piece away from the Cologne combo here, actually. We're going to Ultra Ball down and have Bib Barrel draw one. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Shiver first, attach the energies to Greninja... So we're really committing to this line to draw even more cards from the bib, drawing three here, plus poker stop, plus having concealed cards as an option. We can draw quite a few here. We see eight cards, and straight away we hit the cologne, and uh, yeah, you got to lean into the high roll plays sometimes, and the deck is pretty disgusting when it comes off. Well, we're just going to take out two rolls here. It was a slow start from the Guardi, admittedly. They didn't have a supporter turn one. 
Um, but sometimes <laughs> the, the stars align and you get to see the wombo combos of the deck. So that, that's like the Dr. Jekyll side of Chen Pao. Now we're going to see the Mr. Hyde side where I really had a rough time playing this deck, let me tell you. Plenty of bricks. Um, these are going to be ones where I at least had some options to play the game, but I had quite a good amount of insta concessions, I'm going to be honest. The deck plays five supporters only. Pokestop is, like, not really a supporter card <laughs> because it's sometimes just getting you garbage. Uh, because even if it's hitting item cards, sometimes it's hitting your sort of like mid to late game items, like your superiors, your rods, your cross switches, your colognes. So even with a high item density, it's not always getting you into the game. And let's face it, this is one of the most high maintenance early game decks in the game. And we're also very vulnerable to path. Uh, recently, Grant Shen cut the Lost Vacuum from the list just to play an extra like ball search or slash consistency card. And I think generally it's pretty okay and correct, but there is the big caveat that when you do get jammed with a path, you really are stunted. And even with a triple irrita opening here, it's going to be really tough for us to play this game. And uh, we're up against Tina, of course. Tina and Maridon are probably the main like path decks in the game right now, and DTE Mew, actually. So there is still a decent amount of path in the game. So it is very worrying to not have um, vacuum in the deck but the idea is that with four stadiums and early emphasis on big barrel you still give yourself a bit of draw to get towards it but it doesn't always come off <laughs> the opponent actually has a slow start here no cram pressure and uh, no greninja that would have been the nightmare scenario right if they had been able to get to seven but with that not coming together we do have a chance to do something here in the game. Um, I'm just going for another candy backs here and just going to go for a clean uh, five cards from the bib. I think that's a decent idea just to get into the game here. The, the concept around this was it's the best way for me to play around a Greninja play from my opponent even if they... Um, even if I do nothing. Unfortunately, we have the superior in hand... Um, but only one energy in the discard pile, so I really can't do much with this and just have to pass. But the idea was just going immediate candy backs here rather than like trying to get Chen into the mix and do this, that, and the other. I would still always be doing the, the barrel play, um, but I was just really hoping to... like If I go for the Chen route, it just means that I really had to hit a poker stop to make it feel right. But if I go for the candy backs, I'm at least like not in danger immediately of like uh, Cram just taking prizes or Sableye taking multiple prize knockouts, uh, which incidentally is coming into play now. We are vulnerable to both Greninja and Sableye at this stage. Uh, I would hate Greninja doing 90-90 on the backs. I would also hate uh, Sableye just taking out Bit Barrel here because I hand is a lot of hand thinning and... Uh, yeah, looks like they're going for the bib, which really hurts us. Uh, because now we're just in top deck mode. We've played three of our supporter cards, and we have so much jank in our deck. Top decking the water means I can actually attack here with Buster Tail. Um, which at least forces them to maybe start attacking with Tina. Honestly, they could still just go 90-90 on our backs here and like slow roll the entire board. I don't know. Shred is also looking really strong here, right? I have a two-card hand. <laughs> and uh, getting through Tina is going to be tough. So yeah, I mean, this path is just stuck all game, and it's completely wrecking us. Even with the barrel being made. So, just something to note that I had plenty of bricks with the deck, <laughs> and it's like, it's just that you need so much. It's like not just candy... You also need to thin a ton of energy. You normally need to hire all superior fairly early on after a couple concealed cards. You need to have backup Fridgey. You need to probably get one bib online before you've taken your first two price knockout. You're just going to brick. There's like so much that the deck actually needs in the opening stages. And so few supporters to actually help you get there. <laughs> As the opponent just uh, starts to thread through the board. We eventually find the poker stop, but it is far too late. So we're going to be looking at that top right hand corner. And hitting that concede button, which I did quite a lot with Gem Pao, actually. <laughs> uh, I know this is like one of the more consistent lists, but this is definitely a best of three deck, right? There's no doubt about that. That you just have to take L's on the chin, knowing that the high rolls are like super high. Probably the highest 
power level ceiling deck in the game right now. Uh, I think like that and Guardi do the, the most powerful cheatsy doodly things. And um, unfortunately, the floor for this deck is like so low. <laughs> you, you go, the game gets out of control real quick. Uh, we're actually up against a Charizard arc here, which should be, again, theoretically one of our best matchups, I would say. We have one hit go potential, especially with the arc, we have even more multi prizes to cash in on. You'd think we'd be looking pretty good here. We got the early concealed cards, we got double Friggy and Bidoof down, we're holding Candy back, so this hand is such a great start for us. Let's see uh, how the game progresses. The opponent's gonna Mysterious Tail, then Starbirth. Gonna see the Jacques actually getting Bib and Zard. We saw the Mysterious Tail for the Candy, I believe, so. Yeah, they're popping off, doing the stuff. Definitely an argument for me there to... Well, it was a defensive cross switcher right, just so that I could have the chance to protect concealed cards. Because with this uh, Trinity Nova, I'm once again in top deck mode, right? I could try and panic cross switch the bib next turn. But it's such a like vital resource. And uh, yeah, we're basically just toast <laughs> from that stage on, right? Uh, I think if we do go for cross switch a Biv, there's like a chance that they don't just come back and hit us. But we've already seen jet energy from them, and uh, like I don't even know what top set decks get us out of that mess. It has to be like exactly Ultra Ball, Irida, or Bib, right? I suppose Pokestop could also get us there. Maybe that was a preemptive concession, but uh, basically I was rage quitting quite a lot with Chen Pao. So you really have to take it on the chin that this deck is going to just have those Lego games of all your energy recovery cards or just not enough ball search because the deck needs Greninja, Friggy, Friggy, Bib, or like Bidoof, Bidoof when you go second. That's like a lot of things that you need. And in some of those equations, you also need Manaphy. So like, man, you really need to have hot starts with the deck to do well with Chen Pao. But that being said, I did have some really impressive games. The matchup spread is there for Chen Pao, so... I don't know, it still could be worth the risk. I think this is one of the higher risk, higher reward decks in the game right now. Let me know your thoughts down below, and I'll see you tomorrow for another video. Cheers.